Just back from the Bassmaster Elite Series on Lake Oahe in South Dakota. If you want the full behind the scenes, stick around because we got another Jake's take. This week, once again, Bassmaster cameraman Jake Latondres on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Once again, welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkward Day Honest Fishing Podcast. It goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Let's jump right into it. I'm literally just got back from Lake Oahe in South Dakota. Cited the eighth stop of the Bassmaster Elite Series. And that's why in the tease, I said, you're going to see the full behind the scenes, some of the nitty gritty dirt. Some dirt that some people don't want us to talk about. Some dirt that uh, just needs to be talked about. But I'm going to be talking to Jake Latondres, friend of the show. You guys know him from Jake's Take, Bassmaster, cameraman extraordinaire. And uh, he's going to be joining us here in just a few minutes. But um, it was a big event, a lot going on. Um, a lot of moving pieces with the season winding down. Our second last stop of the Bassmaster Elite Series of the season of 2022. After this, we're heading to La Crosse, Wisconsin. By the time you're watching this, most likely, we're in La Crosse, Wisconsin for the ninth stop of the Bassmaster Elite Series and the final one of 2022. So we'll crown another champion. We'll crown our Rookie of the Year, our Angler of the Year, and uh, all our classic births and requalifications and all that sort of stuff. So it is um, the most uncomfortable time of the year to have my job. Or Jake's. I mean, this is when uh, tempers flare. This is when everybody has a lot on the line. So um, I'm not going to talk about it myself. Just myself. I'm going to bring in a guy who sees it all, hears it all. And is often the only other human being on the boat with the person when they are winning. A man that has attended 64 Grateful Dead concerts. 64. The one and only Jake Latondres. Let's bring him in right now. Jake Latondres, we are back. Reunited and it <laughs> feels so good. I don't like these big gaps between no. tournaments because like, that bums me out, man. I, I miss you. <laughs> wow, this sounded in a, weird. In a, in a in a very masculine way, of course. <laughs> of course, well, what other way could it be? This is a freaking fishing podcast, a very That's manly right. podcast. That's right. Speaking of manly, we got back from one of the most manly and cool places on earth, uh, Lake Oahe, and that whole state of South Dakota is. Dude, I kept explaining it to people. I'm like, it is literally like Earth before we destroyed it with drive-throughs and strip malls. Like, it, it's it's it, when it's you stand Mars. places, you're like, man, this is this is how it all started. You know what I mean? And the weird thing is, there's very few trees, so you can see very far, and it's just it's it's a it's a just an awesome place. It's one of those places that I am thankful for bat, for our gig. Because you know what? I'll be honest. I don't know that I ever would have seen South Dakota if it wasn't for fishing. And uh, thank God I did because more people need to see it, I think. I have some back history there because my dad was born and raised in South Dakota. And Holy something. There's a all, all, <laughs> another layer of onion peel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I used to fish as a co-angler on the professional walleye trail. And I fished Lake Oahe many times. I fished it for walleyes. Never, I have never caught a single smallmouth on Lake Oahe in my life, but hundreds of walleyes, right? And I go back there, and every time I go back there, like you said, I feel like I'm on another planet because no one lives out there. It looks like Mars in the, you know, in August, it looks like Mars because everything's dried up. And then you you come to this gigantic, what is it, 300 miles long, Lake Oahe? Yeah, 270 miles long, I think, yeah. It, it's And it, it just goes on forever. And the fact that it has these, I mean, relatively speaking, it has giant smallmouth in it. And it because of yeah, the lack of... Yeah, but let's talk about that because the weirdest thing is like you, the amount of people 
like the amount of anglers leaving Oahe this week that said it didn't show up. Like, you know, they didn't know it was didn't know how to so good. It. What, no, but you know what I mean? Like a lot of our field has pre-fished there and they all came back saying like this place, this place could break a hundred pounds in itself. You know, it was that good. It was 20 pounds everywhere. So we definitely hit it on a weird time, uh, which, which is frustrating because, because uh, I mean, you, you imagine it was that good and with everything else we experienced. Right. I mean, and, and people had it gone that way, we would all be comparing it in a very contrasting way to the St. Lawrence river and yeah. Lake Ontario. Right. Because when they catch a five or six pounder on Lake Oahe, it, it is, I mean, it looks like that it's got a tiny mouth and it's this, this abnormally big, small mouth. And you just go, this is just freaking unbelievable. I mean, I, I love I love it up there. I love the fact that there, there's no one up there. It's it's isolated and desolate. And I like that about South Dakota. If you want to get away from everybody, go to South Dakota. Yeah. More so this time. You know, when we went to Pier, I True. guess, you know, and I got to see the Badlands and some really cool stuff. And you get out there and you're like, wow, this is wild. But where we were in Mobridge, I mean, literally, you like we would where we were staying was seven minutes from takeoff, but it was the end of town. Like it was there was after that, it's like literally you drive forever and you see the odd, odd house every once in a while. So when we were in Pier, that's a, I mean, that's the state capital. So I just feel like it didn't have as much of that rugged feel. But man, it was it was freaking cool like that, you said that's western <laughs> yeah i, I mean, mean it is freaking let's get western because that's what it is and you know uh, here's another uh, uh nugget about south dakota south dakota is one of the premier places on planet earth where dinosaur remains are continuously found by archaeologists in fact here's another layer of onion peel that i have a friend of mine named susan hendrickson who lives in Honduras now. She's American. Uh, she was a marine archaeologist for the Jacques Cousteau Society for many, many years. And she's a friend of our families. She was on an archae on, on a terrestrial archaeolo archaeological dig in South Dakota many like 20 years ago. And she was coming back from a dig by herself. She and her dog, a golden retriever named Sky, they had a flat tire. So they radioed for help. She didn't have a spare. They radioed for help. She did. While she was waiting on her colleagues to come get her, she walked up to this, this cliff band with her dog. But she drove by it every day thinking there's got to be something in there. And it's a, it's a sheer cliff. So she knew she could look up there in the layers and, and possibly find something. So she walks up there to this shelf. And her dog Sky starts digging and she walks over to it and it's this gigantic knuckle that's sticking out of the earth. And then she starts uh, brushing away at it with her hands. And to make a long story short, as it turns out, it is the most complete T-Rex remains ever found on planet earth. And it has like, it only missed, was only missing like 35 bones in the entire skeleton. And it is the t-rex that stands erect in the lobby of the chicago natural history museum now and that came from that part of south dakota that's a fact wow yeah that's impressive i thought only yeah. the rock got to have a t-rex head behind him no. you have a contact that found that's pretty that i all, mean that'd be a cool you guys job think about that like but you're literally still a kid like you gotta be more professional i know you gotta wear leather boots and crap like that and but you're just every day i'm just going digging for treasure crap. hunting yeah treasure, treasure hunt. hunting i mean that's what they did when she worked for jacques cousteau they literally found <laughs> jacques cousteau treasures. <laughs> yeah so uh yeah that's a that's a pretty cool fact about south dakota and there's still lots of dinosaurs there under underground to to be uh to be found wow wow that just went on a whole different direction than I ever imagined, yeah. but that's so the, how cool South Dakota is. So those of you watching Google s s the T-Rex named Sue, they named that T-Rex after Susan and it's called Sue. So anyway, let's talk about fishing. <laughs> Come on. I'm Googling this right now. Google it. 
Google it, Joe. We're going to find out you have been lying about everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to find out that I've been telling the truth about everything. Oh, my God. Here it is. Susan Hendrickson. Sue the T-Rex. Oh, my yep. God. Look at it. It is gigantic. I wish we had a Jamie, like, on <laughs> Rogan's podcast. We uh, throw a picture up right now, but we don't have a Jamie. Um, use your Google machine, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you have one on something. And check out that because it it is gigantic. Um, it's, it's the whole thing. And it's weird, dude, when you say that. Like, it, there was times when we were driving, especially like I went to see uh, Lee and Caleb. Uh, me and Davey went out there one day. We had time for lunch and we drove out and um, it sucked because it was a Sunday. It was the last day we were going to be there. I wish I had driven out there to New Everett Marina um, mm-hmm. or Boat Center or whatever it was called, where they were all staying, which evidently becomes a nightclub on Saturday nights. Like literally they have a DJ. There was hundreds of people from I mean, you drive forever and you don't see a home. So you're like, where do these people party? Well, it's there. But that hill, when you come down that hill, is just beautiful. Is that not? Oh, one that's of the- what I was going to say. That's why I was bummed that we found it in the last day. I got back. I told Overstreet. I'm like, you need to go there. It is like, beautiful. I mean, I've driven the Ring of Kerry in Ireland and so many amazing roads that uh, Tale of the Dragon and stuff. This road is right up there with them. Like you drive and you're like, how is this even re- like it looks like you're driving on a movie set it's just so vast and and but i was what i was going to say is it literally when i was driving along i think i made the joke to davy i mean i'm like you could see a freaking t-rex come rolling over that mound exactly. there and it wouldn't seem shocking um <laughs> little did i know <laughs> so these these small mouth have gotten must have this prehistoric dna because that's what they look like when they catch one they're, yeah. they're like these dinosaur big ones. They're like dinosaurs. And they must have a really good proliferation of, of recruitment in that lake because there's millions of little ones in there too. Yeah. Yeah. I think we hit it on a weird week. I mean, you know, they caught them, but it but it it was a weird week. And um I think our anglers are quickly getting addicted to that forward facing sonar smack, though. Oh, like it's think? like nobody even looks at the bank anymore. They're just looking down um and in it i mean there's a lot of people out there saying that's a problem you know because it it does make the coverage a lot less like we, i think people will realize this week when we go to lacrosse unless they all end up out in the river uh looking at them on wing dams which could happen but <laughs> somebody will but that ain't what's gonna happen right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i lacrosse is always one of the most visually appealing it's a lot of frog bites an old school tournament but i think when you watch the coverage there and you watch what happened last week it is a much different thing and for the first time in my life i'm like yeah maybe this this does change things in a very very big way but um i think it does too and that's a whole nother podcast but you know, they still got to catch them. Yeah. And I think one of the things that that, you know, like the, the front facing sonar does an active active sonar does is it shows them actually how many more fish are there that don't bite. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Someone said that on stage. He said everybody on the Internet saying stuff about forward facing sonar. Uh, how easy it is. But it's also very frustrating because, you know, what's there. Um, and it, it's uh it's almost antisocial though. Like I would imagine even on the water, like, you know, like when you're out there and you're fishing, it's different than throwing a frog. It's different than do, you know, throwing a drop shot and not looking at your graph. It, you, it makes you want to not talk. It makes you want to. So it's, it's like, it's, it's like you're on your phone the whole time. It's, it's, exactly. just, it's like, it's like this the whole time. Pretty yeah. much. It's a great think analogy. For, for my, you know, for my, job to create at least some kind of informative uh content you know i zoom in on i zoom when they find a fish i zoom in on the screen as much as i can of course you know they've all got their their live target or 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 a live scope mounted on the 
ex- very tip of their boat and it's facing exactly forward so they know exactly what what sh- what straight north is to, to their boat right yeah and they, so they know how to cast when they find a fish they know exactly what direction to, to cast and so as a as a result of that when they're on their trolling motor they stand centered in front of their screen so even when there's something going on and they're running their trolling motor i have to like I have to zoom in between their legs to get the a shot of the screen, <laughs> but it's usually to the far left of their screen because they're targeting the fish that are right under their boat. Yeah. You know, it's particularly the small mouth in deeper yeah. water. Right. Yeah. Well, like you said, that, that, that's a whole other podcast in itself. And uh, I think us just even bringing up the words will fire up a bunch of people in the comments because people do feel passionate about it one way or another. And what I will say is how cool is it? We're part of a sport where people care that much. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I like agree. It, there, trust me, there is somebody walking past these arguments that doesn't fish. That's like, what a bunch of, well, why are they arguing over that? Like, why, why are they? Because people care and people, people want it to be, they want the future of the sport to be strong. And, and dude, here's my honest opinion on the future of the sport and the future of how that affects fish. Fish adapt. Like, honestly, everybody that says you're going to fish out lakes, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. That's the same thing that they said when zebra mussels came. That's the same thing they said when gobies came. That's the same thing they said when every invasive species everywhere, with the exception of carp. I mean, because that's a whole different mass issue. You're taking over the every lake can support a certain mass of fish. When you unbalance it, it's a totally different thing. So I do think that fish and I, I think we're already seeing it. Why was the Carolina rig such a big player in this event? Because although that body of water gets very little pressure, a place that gets very little pressure is more affected by pressure. So I feel like the pressure that they felt, you saw how those fish change. And as the tournament, like I've had anglers say on Tuesday when they were pre-fishing, they'd see a fish and a fish would literally fire 15 feet to eat their bait. I mean, they were just... In they were 20 like, feet of water, stupid. come up yeah. come up to six feet to look at their bait and then turn around and swim back down. Yeah. Like yeah. like a lot and or or a fish that was suspended six feet under the surface in 20 feet of water would go down, check out their bait at 20 feet and come back and, and suspend at six feet again. It was going both ways, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the interesting part about the whole sonar controversy about how much we're learning about what these fish are doing. What if what if they were so focused on their on their sonar units that they missed out on a big bite in super shallow water on top water or spinner baits or, or something like that? I mean, what if what if that we was hardly what was saw going on? It. no we, one, a few nobody, people did it. Yeah, very few. And um, but but I honestly think that I mean, Seth Fighter said it best years ago. He's told me he said, "Man, it's just going to be a big casting contest," and that's why the Carolina rig played because you can sling that sucker a mile from your boat, and even and not just that. There's a lot of stuff you can cast far, but the difference with the rig is you can cast it far and. It's one hook. You have good landing percentage and the further a fish is from the boat. So that's, I mean, I think that what we saw this weekend is a prime example of why you know that fish will adapt to it. I agree. I I, I totally, totally agree. And again, you know, we can't get into this deeper into this controversy about it all, but I'm at, at, at at the professional level, like, let's just compare it to something in the NFL, you know, in college, they can't use, they can't use an earbud in their helmet to get plays from the sidelines or the coordinators up in the press box. But in the, at the professional level, they use radio communication to call plays from the sideline or the coordinators up in the press box to the quarterback. You know I mean? There's, there's an, there's, there's at the professional level, at the elite level, I think if it, if it comes into play, I mean, maybe the a rig, you know, is a is a, a whole. That's a whole. Other I think if you went back, the A rig shouldn't have been banned. I think most people admit. You know what I mean? Like it, it, mm-hmm. it is a tool that works for a certain period of time, and I think that's what will happen with forward facing sonar. But then you also got to take into account that it's it's going to evolve and it's going to get better. Um, 
It, it's it's, it it's a wild thing. You're going to get roasted. I never thought you would, but you're going to get roasted for that analogy. You threw an NFL analogy out. Most people that hate the NFL hate hate four faced sonar. I bet. <laughs> Hey be man, I'm just making a comparison, right? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying one way or another, but I just think at the professional nobody's level, ever said a bad thing about you in the comments ever, Jake. Ever, <laughs> okay, okay. Then, then bring it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they won't. They won't. You take, your smile's too nice. People like you. Um, <laughs> but like hey. you said, it doesn't come into play at every tournament, every event, with every angler, and there are people that are going to beat people that are fishing more traditional ways with more simple uh, uh, techniques are going to win over someone with forward facing sonars in different events. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's never going to be settled and it's never going to be, it's never going it, to, it, it's always going to be, you know, controversial. Right? Yeah. 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 And, and not the, you know, the other argument you hear people say, well, it's pricing people out of the sport. Really? Like I'm not being a, Jackass, but come on. I mean, bass boats are pricing people out of the sport. Uh, gas. Gas is doing more to price people out of the sport than any electronics in the history of mankind. Um, so, yeah, it's it's another tool you got to. I mean, I think it's ridiculous if you look at how our boats are set up as it is. I mean, I have more money in electronics on my current boat than I spent on my first bass boat for the whole thing. Um, so it's crazy, but let's not get uh, off on this. Hey, the star of this tournament, I would say the unsung hero comes from the Lone Star State in this tournament. And uh, Lee Livesey, I mean, a lot of those dudes catching him on. I'm not saying he was the only one, but a lot of those dudes that caught him on a Carolina rig got put onto it by Lee. And, and, and most of them said it on stage. So I'm not saying anything isn't, but I mean, tournament champion austin felix he was fishing and he got put onto it he didn't catch all his fish like that but it was definitely a key and i heard him thank lee on stage told him he owes lee some kind of alcoholic money. beverage <laughs> i guess i, I don't know a maybe beer. money a um, beer. he's got free beer <laughs> yeah and he put fighter on it and a few different guys on it so um kudos to lee livesey um friend of the I'm show I I am really proud. I was talking to Lee uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, he was on his way to lacrosse. Yeah. And he called and we were just chit chatting about things. And I said, we were talking about marketing and, and promoting and, and branding yourself and all those, you know, those, those conversation pieces. And I said, you know, Lee, I'm really proud of how you have developed your, all of your, your well-rounded fishing skills, because you're talking about a guy, like you said, from the Lone Star state of Texas, the Lake Forks and the, uh, the, you know, the Ray Roberts lakes and all these big largemouth bass, uh, um, uh, locations that don't have anything that are, that are the farthest thing from smallmouth bass world in North America. Uh, North America that you can get from and he has spent his time like he yeah. spends his time up on Champlain and the St. Lawrence River and he's really honed his skills and you can see it even though he's not winning those smallmouth tournaments he comes from behind and makes these huge jumps because he unlocks some secret that he figures out because he understands these fisheries better and like you said kudos to him for doing that because he has definitely put in his time and it shows yeah now and and i'm gonna say and i say it all the time about him every chance i get there's a dude that it, i don't know why but for whatever reason people aren't stopping to say holy shnikes what he has accomplished in the last like He's won four Bassmaster events and he's been here for like, that's in three four years, years. He's, in three yeah. years, he has won four Bassmaster events and we throw that number around like, but like, just look at how many people like, and I don't want to get into a like, yo, this, I'm not comparing him. Yeah. He's Lee just in wins. Dean Rojas has five. Five and Dean Rojas is a guy that you know people set aside as a frog dude and everything and a big and an innovator and he is, but Lee Livesey man to have four wins that is not a slight on Dean Rojas, for the record. That is me just giving you an idea of like if you realize 
Lee Livesey is one win away from Dean Rojas's total Bassmaster wins. So in three years, has, yeah. was he not? Was there not a some sort of a trivial fact that he has reached three elite wins? as fast or faster, or at least very close to the fastest people that ever won three Bassmaster elite level wins in their careers in three years. I'm not sure, Jake. Thanks. For I think, me I think, stupid. yeah, I think it must be. I mean, he's pretty freaking close. Um, he's got to be in a, in a rare group there, but, um, yeah, no, I mean, if you heard it, I'm sure it's true. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he's got his game. His game is just so strong and he's so well rounded. Um, I'm, it's, it's impressive. I'm glad we were friends before he turns into a mega superstar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ronnie Moore, chime in. Let us know what the true stat is. Yeah, Speaking of which, do. and I don't give Ronnie credit very often, one of the funniest lines on Bass Life this weekend was from Ronnie Moore and, um, it was when Chris Johnson was culling a fish and he was, I mean, several times I saw him with smaller fish than I've ever seen him with smallmouth bass in his life. And he called a fish and he threw it back. And Ronnie's like, uh, Chris Johnson just threw a fish back that did not make a splash, which I thought was very, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great line. line. Line of the tournament. It made a uh, ripple. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. It was, it like, was a great like, analogy. <laughs> that, is, that is awesome. That is awesome. Um, well, we're we're like um, as long as most podcasts by this point, and we haven't really gotten into it, Jake. Let's uh, talk about the actual tournament and um, and your experience on the water, and give people some little tidbits of things that uh, they may or may not have seen. Um, you were who were you with on day one? David Mullins. Mullins, tell Mullins. me about your day. He never really could figure it out. I was actually happy, you know, David Mullins is a big duck hunter. So he and I talked oh, yeah. a fair amount about duck hunting. He came out to Nebraska and duck hunted with me last year. And, uh, you know, he and I get along very well. So I was actually very happy to be in his boat because it's been a while. Um, but it, he was, he was in the right location. I didn't know because it was day one. I didn't know where anyone was going to catch any fish. Yeah. But here's the thing that I figured out very quickly, and so did a lot of people, was this is a huge, huge impoundment. It's 300 miles, almost 300 miles long, right? They narrowed it down to a 10-mile stretch pretty much, right? And, and the thing about day one after takeoff was as big as that lake is, there were – they they were fishing on top of each other, yeah. literally fishing on top of each other. There was like nine boats. When we got to Mullins' first spot, he goes, holy crap, how many people, how many people, I didn't realize there were that many people that knew about this, this spot. So while he's fishing there, Brian Schmidt was the first one to pull up on the spot. And, and everyone knew it because he was one of the first ones out that morning. So he was the first one. And then, Chris Johnston was there. Swindle was there. Uh, I, I don't even, Brian knew was there. I don't even remember how many, who all yeah. was there, but there was like 11 boats on this one point at one time. It looked like they were, you know, le leech bait dunker walleye fishermen drifting for walleyes. That's what it looked like. And so that became a problem. And you just sit there asking yourself, how, how does this happen on, on a body of water this big? How does this happen with, uh, you know, nine, what is it? 94 anglers on the lake? 90. 90. Right at 90. Yeah. It was 91, but we sent, uh, we, we had a switch out. Speaking of which Clark Wendlet thoughts and prayers with you. He's doing well. Had what, what happened? I mean, he had an injury in his eye. He was up there and Clark was one of the dudes. When I said a lot of dudes were excited and said, you, this could be one of the best smallmouth tournaments ever. He was one of the dudes that came up and said that. Um, but he came all the way, went all the way up there, was ready to start pre fish, woke up, and his one eye was blood, all like literally could not see out of it. It was red, things were blurry. Um, but the good news is, I don't know exactly what I, I kept calling it an injury on stage, but it's not exactly an injury, but it's not a condition either. It was. 
So anyways, well, whatever it is, whatever the right name for educated people to call it is, um, <laughs> the good news is that Patty and Clark got back to Texas fine, and um, the prognosis is good. Um, good. He's undergoing some treatments and stuff, and Clark Wendlet should be back in the Bassmaster Elite Series. So thoughts and prayers with with both Patty and Clark, um, and uh, sucks for him to um, – most of, I mean, he said it best. Um, he said, uh, what, what was his line? He said, uh, I, I, don't, I'm, I plan on fishing lots of tournaments in the future, and I only have two eyes, so I don't want to mess around. So uh, so great, uh, great thinking. But we did a switch out. We got another Texas dude. We sent one back to Texas, and another one came up is Brad Watley, who mm-hmm. has suffers with Crohn's, and, man, he – went through some treatments and he did something that I don't think any other elite series pros ever done. And that's come back the same year that you left from a medical absence. And he, uh, he made it into the Saturday cut. So congratulations, Brad Watley and good to have you back. And um, sorry, I just didn't a little, I felt while we were going there, I had to at least mention Clark, but 90 anglers back to your point, Jake, somebody complained about me interrupting people last week. So I've got to get under control. Well, you'd asked about Mullins' day one, and I think, you know, as the days went on, and we'll get to this later, but I was in Taku's boat on day three and four, and he was fishing the same spots. They were just running points, and I think, again, going full circle back to the earlier conversation about a, a lake that doesn't have a lot of pressure on their bass can't take a lot of pressure, and I think... What happened on day one in some of those spots is there was too much pressure on those points. Yeah. But but then uh, Swindle pulls up like David Mullins was being a gentleman. He goes, dude, I just cannot. I want to be over there where those guys are, but they're nose to nose and bumper to bumper. And I'm just not that guy. I'm not going to move in on them. I'm just going to do this out here my way. And if they move, I'll go in there and see if what's left. And Swindle swings around. He comes rolling in pulls up, drops his troll motor, goes right into the group, and uh, boom, boom, boom. I actually filmed him from Mullins' boat catch three, <laughs> I would say three to three and a half pounders, right off, literally, boom, right off the bat. So <laughs> it was it was combat fishing there. <laughs> That's horrible, Jay. You know you're having a bad day when your camera guy's filming another boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's just like... You imagine just there's got to be a second where and Mullins is like one of the most entertaining dudes on earth, but a second he, AOI. He, he have a hard time showing you that. I mean, you need like I mean, if he would just give a little bit of the off camera Mullins to the world, I would love it. I mean, he's he's very entertaining, but I could just imagine Mullins turn around and be like, "Great." My camera guy's shooting <laughs> swindle now. <laughs> I'm sitting there waiting on someone to start yelling at another person because they were so close to each other. But, I mean, everybody just kept their space, and I'm sure they were, you know, holding it in. There was probably two or three cameras there, too, because there were wow. so many boats. So, you know, everyone was behaving in front of the teacher, right? <laughs> yeah. No, they didn't all behave. There was some disagreements this week, but we won't get into those. I mean, it is the season, tail end of the season, tempers flare and people get, get wound up. A lot of, a lot of stress and anxiety. People don't realize the stress and anxiety Gosh, yeah. these guys have on their shoulders. This is a business to them. And, you know, when you start winding down the season and you're struggling for two things, one to get into the classic, which is the goal from day yeah. one, or struggling just to make sure they freaking come back next year, right? Or whatever, you know, there's, there's so much pressure on, on these guys. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's for me, and I'm sure it is for you. It's easy to overlook a lot of things that get said and, and things that are, that are done, especially late in the season because of all the stress and anxiety that goes on. Oh yeah. It's, it's my least favorite two events of the year. The last two, just cause people have so much pressure on them and everything you explained there. So, um, so you know what's what, funny I, about the last one too, though, the last one, everyone's ready to beat everyone's like burnout ready for the season to be over. And then the moment, the moment you guys walk off stage after you present the last trophy to the last winner of the season, everybody's kind of, at least I am. And I know I've shared this with a lot of other people uh, on our crew. 
is dang it, man, this is over until February or March now, you know? Yeah. And I don't want it to be over now. <laughs> yeah. No, it, 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 uh, that just shows you you're doing something cool. You know what I mean? I've always told my kids when we leave a vacation and, um, and they're upset, like you should be. I mean, if you're not upset at the end of a vacation, if you're not upset at the end of a trip, you didn't We're have a good fun. trip. You didn't have a good vacation and you just want to get home. So, uh, so yeah, no, we, we all kind of feel that. I think that's, um, we miss each other. Yeah. Well, it's There's a it lot of friendships. Like, yeah. But it seems like it's going to last forever at certain times. You're just like, well, we have so many events ahead. And then all of a sudden you're like, but wait a second, what it's done. Um, so speaking of cool times together, you and uh, several of the other camera crew arranged it. I think you brought the steaks and everything, but dude, we had a great cookout and it was awesome to, I think that's the first time that many um, of the visual producers of Bass got together, like everybody. I mean, Overstreet was with me. And I mean, I was a, the only person that doesn't take pictures and shoot video, basically, that was there. Um, but it was cool to hang with with the Bass family. And uh, man, it, it, it's that's part of the reason we miss it. You know, if we worked exactly. with a bunch of jackasses, she'd be like, I can't wait not to see you next week. Uh, but exactly. We, we, work we have with great cool jobs folks. with some great people. Everyone's in it for each other. And and we did, since I drove up from Colorado, it was a seven and a half hour drive for me. And I, I, I was due for a, a short road trip like that just to sort of reset. You know, that's like when I solve a lot of problems when I'm on the road like that. So I chose to drive up and I brought a big Yeti cooler and I filled it full of uh, New York strips and, and chicken and, and some other stuff and brought a grill and some charcoal. And we decided to have a cookout and it turned out really, really great. And, yeah. I, and now we're talking about, you know, keeping a grill in the camera trailer just to have at events so we can do that at least one every tournament. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's especially now restaurants are a joke. Like nobody works. <laughs> I, don't, exactly. I still don't get it, but you go and the place is half empty and they're like, that'll be 45 minutes for a table. And you're like, but and there's $45 later. <laughs> Speaking, <laughs> hey, I have a restaurant story to tell you that was funny that happened this week. Um, <laughs> he's probably going to kill me for telling this, but that's what makes it a good story. <laughs> so me and Davey found this great, one restaurant in town, not that it was the only one, but it was this one restaurant in town, the Great Plains Family Diner, I think it is, or family restaurant. And it um, it's only open until two o'clock. So it's a breakfast, lunch place. It, it, seemingly, it's run by all family. I mean, everybody has a similar look. I think their family, if not, they'll either find this funny or not funny. Um, but anyways, we were going there. The great people, awesome place. If you're ever in Mobridge, South Dakota, go there. It's the place to be. But uh, Davey Height asked me to go to breakfast one morning. I couldn't go to breakfast and um, not a big breakfast guy on the road. So, um, so he decided to go to this place for breakfast by himself. So, and he would always sit, <laughs> he sits in the front there. So I'm just trying to paint the picture, sits at the table where everyone's sitting type thing, you know, the diner counter. Well, mm -hmm. so Dave, Davey Hyde decides, well, me and Mercer are going to go here for lunch, so I don't want to eat too much. So he goes to this one little section on the menu, and it's the lighter side. So he's, you know, going to order something small, and he sees on the menu. And to me, well, as soon as he said it, I knew where it was going to go. But may maybe, uh, I don't know why Davey didn't. But uh, so he said, I saw this pancake, a Mickey Mouse pancake, and I ordered it. And he said, I thought. You know, it was just like a, I mean, Mickey Mouse, a small, like it's a Mickey Mouse pancake. A big pancake with two small pancakes was, for years. It literally was a Mickey <laughs> Mouse pancake with the shape and the <laughs> smiley face and the whipped cream and the jube jubes or whatever, <laughs> whatever they use, chocolate chips. And it it's all painted and nice. And I could just imagine the Bassmaster Classic Champions. <laughs> There he did eating Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse pancake. <laughs> he said it was delicious, but a little embarrassing. So uh, we should, uh, that, if you'd have been there, you could have taken a picture of it. Oh, I would have loved it. I would have <laughs> loved it. And we went in there for lunch that day, and I'm like, "Did you see what he did to to the waitress?" And she's like, "We all saw what he did." <laughs> <laughs> see, that's that's 
those are the kinds of things that do well on social media. A picture of Davy Hyde eating, <laughs> eating a Mickey Mouse pancake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so is that day one? Day one, you were with Mullins. Got anything else for day one? Or are we going to jump to day two? Let's go to day two. Okay. Day two, who are you with? Drew Cook. Ah, yes. Drew Cook. Yes, I haven't had a great day one. I mean, uh, 20 pounds, one of the biggest bags of the day. Like, I think he was in second, wasn't he? Yeah, he was in second. And I thought, I was like, oh, this is going to be really interesting. And when I got in his boat that morning before takeoff, I said, are you in one of those community spots or you got this spot all to yourself? And he said, no, nah, dude, I'm like, I, I've, you know, there's a lot of fish there and I'm all by myself. So we run down past the bridge and he gets to a spot and sure enough, you know, he's all by himself. We ran past um, Brandon Card, who was leading after yeah. day one. He had a big day. We ran past him, went through the bridge and down down a little bit further and got on a spot and the fish were there. He's like, oh, dude, this is getting ready to go down. They're, they're here. They are here. And that's when that whole thing that you were talking about before we started recording the podcast started going down where – these fish were coming up from 18 to 23 feet of water to check out his lure as soon or his, his drop shot. As soon as it hit the water and started to fall, these fish would rocket up. You could see him on, on live scope, rocket up to the bait, look at the bait and then slowly Damn. swim back down to where they came from. And then, and even in reverse, He'd be moving along, looking for fish. His drop shot would be on the bottom, and the fish would come down and look at it, turn and, and swim away. So it was very frustrating for him. His fish, no doubt, were there. He was on a location that was key and was holding a lot of fish. He just could not. He caught some fish, yeah. but he didn't catch the fish that he needed, and they were yeah. there. Frustrating. Frustrating. Yeah, it was. But I, I always like being in the boat with Drew. He's great. We, he is. He's. I, I really like Drew Cook a lot, and he is. He takes his job very seriously. <laughs> he does, he and does. I appreciate and, that about him. And he should. I mean, you know, I, I think this is high praise. But young Greg Hackney—that's what he reminds me of. You know what I mean? Like he's yeah. very dialed in. Um, got a great sense of humor, and will joke around and whatever. But when it's work time, it's work time. And yeah, um, yeah, he yeah, game face. He's got a game face that's very serious, and and uh, and he knows he knows what he's doing too, man. Yeah, for sure. So, day three, day three, and day four, I was with Takumi Ito, Taku, Smallmouth Disneyland, the and I knew that night. That night, you know, after uh, I knew actually right after Drew Cook weighed in or, or the weigh-in was over and, and, you know, we knew who the top 10 was going to be. I knew exactly who uh, West was going to put me in a boat with, Taku. I always get the Japanese guy because I'm half Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good match. It's a great match. You know, Taku and I are building a relationship and, and I really like it. And it's something that that you and I were talking about again before we started recording, Taku's, Taku's superstardom is growing like, like nothing else in the sport. He is, he is blowing up because he's so authentic and he's, he's Taku. Yeah. I mean, he's, it doesn't matter where we go. The, he gets one of the largest pops of anybody. And literally the only thing like people are like, well, what is this? You know, what does he do? That's different. He does. He's just real. Like he is. And, and not that he's the only one that's real, but I mean, he, he's a different kind of real. He's Japanese and he's, he's, he's comical. He's animated. He's, he's a cartoon character. He is, you know, he's just funny, man. He just makes every, it's like, it's like Patterson uh, Leith said, you know, the guy from, from Sims. He said it best on my post today on Instagram. He said, the guy just makes me smile. He just, he just, whatever he says, it makes me smile. And that's why people love Taku. Yeah. It's, it's unbridled enthusiasm. That's addictive. Like you just see that somebody, 
And and he's the kind of guy like, I mean, everybody's there that loves what they're doing. But you look across the dock like I've never, ever looked over at him and thought, oh, he looks tired or he's distracted or he's not in a good mood. Like he the Takumi Ito you see on camera is the exact same that you see off camera. Um, it's just even I watched him hug. Austin, when Austin walked off the stage and I'm like, it's just so genuine. You know what I mean? Like, it's not. It's just he's an amazing and and I still go back to that story that, you know, I've probably told a bunch of times on this podcast. I've told it on a bunch of podcasts, but I was scared when I first met him. I remember turning to Zona like I met him at it at an at a bass meeting right before he started the elite series. And he came up and introduced himself to me. Not scared of him physically. Don't worry. I could totally kick no, no, his no, ass, no, even no. with a cold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably not. He, probably, he can't. He, dude, he can't <laughs> even hold a trophy up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, but I, I was scared uh, because at that time, it was like a UFC interview. His wife did all of the talking. Like, Takumi oh. could not speak English at all. And I remember turning to Zona and being like, that's going to be tough to deal with on stage because it gets worse on stage. Like if you can communicate with someone off stage, um, it's not, doesn't mean you can do it on stage because on stage, right. everything's amplified. Spontaneous you know. too. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and so interpretations understand like stalling out because he doesn't know what you're saying. You're trying to figure out how to interpret it to him, like body language or, you know, origami or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so I was so concerned and just three years later, he is literally one of the biggest stars in our sport. Um, doesn't matter where we go. People love to see him on stage, you know, and he's just honest. He's just real. And he has every reason not to be, you know what I mean? When you think about it, like he is every, like is, is every reason not to be a crowd favorite, you know what I mean? But he spins it into a positive and um, kudos to him because he learned how to speak English. He learned how to communicate. He learned how to and catch our fish. Yeah. I mean, he'd he never caught a smallmouth like, bass before the elite series. Life. Yeah. And now and that, he's one of the best smallmouth fishermen in the world. Yeah. Literally. Like yeah. he has a different technique. I don't care what anybody says. I've been in Taku's boat. Like, I don't even know how many days a lot right in two in the last two years and he's different he is different than everyone else out there even the other japanese kenta um uh who else we got uh daisuke daisuke how can i forget daisuke he's different he's different he have been in all of their boats i've been in takahiro amori's boat all of them he is he is different he is like a He's like a surgeon with a fishing rod. He is so precise with every little, every little move, how he hooks his bait, how he ties his knots. It's, it's, it's very micro. He's very microscopic in what he does and his baits are different. His taco juice is different. All that stuff. It, it's just, he's so much fun. I learned so much. And I want to say this too, because you and I were talking about kind of pinpointing when he kind of came out of his shell and into stardom. And I believe it was the first time he had a camera in his boat, which was happened to be me at St. Clair uh, two years ago. He caught, do you remember when he caught that big smallmouth with a lamprey yeah. eel on it? Mm -hmm. And that lamprey eel, he's like, oh, what is this? What is, what is, what is? And then he grabbed it with a needle nose pliers and it was squirming around. It fell in his boat and Davy Hyatt was laughing. You were laughing and I was laughing. Taku was going, oh, he was trying to get it out of his boat because he, he called it an alien. And that's when <laughs> he was, he said, this is an alien. That's when everyone, that's when he came out of his shell. And then right after that, he caught like a, a, a 30 pound, musky tiger musky on st Clair with a finesse rig smallmouth fishing and he landed that sucker do you remember that yeah no it was incredible it was, it was incredible yeah. <laughs> and i think i think that's when people started to fall in love with taku and even today when or, or last year when he won the st lawrence 
you know, when he coined smallmouth Disneyland and all that stuff, that was the genuine authenticity that we saw at St. Clair. It just came out in a bigger picture because everyone knew of him. Plus he was catching monster smallmouth up there and it just amplified itself. And now I, I just love that. If I ever saw one, someone misrepresenting or, or mishandling him, like he's one of those guys, if I ever saw someone making fun of him, I would probably come unglued. I think half the, half the field would like, I think yeah. literally he's just that kind of special person. And we're, we're lucky to have him on the elite series. He, uh, so lucky. Yeah. I mean, on the stage moment that I remember is like the first time he took the lead. And I use this example when I'm talking to other elite series pros to Kumi looked at the thing and he's like, I'm number one. Every dude on earth, when they lead the elite series for the first time, say I'm leading, you know what I mean? In their head. But for whatever North American Me? machismo, all of a sudden it comes out as, well, I knew I would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to yeah, me, right. just real and honest. Um, like me, like, <laughs> like, like he was picked, like someone picked him to be like the first pick in a dodgeball game. Like yeah. me, you're picking me. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Uh, and I, another cool moment that you had with him that, that I saw a little bit of is just when he FaceTimes his family at home before he, uh, before takeoff, how cool is that? You know, to how to, wholesome. Wholesome. Yeah. It was it was six fifty one a.m. Nine minutes before takeoff, he's sitting down in his in his driver's seat in his boat. He's got his iPhone on a magnetic clip clip on his dash, and he has his wife Chi and his two young boys on Facetime, and they had those big popsicle stick uh, yeah. taku faces with the Yamaha hat. From the classic. <laughs> From the classic, <laughs> they had those and they were putting those in front of their faces. And it was one of the most wholesome experiences I think I've ever had on the Elite Series. Yeah. That was pretty cool. It was so it was 6 51 a.m. our time. And it was 8 51 p.m. tomorrow, their time. So they were getting ready for bed. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was cool, man. <laughs> He's an awesome, an awesome person. And um kudos to him. You know, and, and I here's another guy that I'll throw in that group, the guy who just won. And I, and I, if, for whatever reason, I've always, from the day Austin kind of came to the Elite Series, I mean, before he came to the Elite Series, I was following his career at FLW and everything like that. But, but he's another example and not, he's another example of somebody who has a lot of reasons not to shine. And that, and what I mean by that is he's not from a different country, but he also is not a very outwardly social person. You know what I mean? He, he, not everyone can be Gerald Swindle, but man, the line of the week, I think from him at the line of the tournament, and I'm sure Bass will pick up on it when they had it all together. But I love that moment. Like when he won and, and like he started cracking up not laughing, cracking up, like tearing up. And he looks out at his dad and he's like, how about this, dad? It was just the uh, most genuine, like saying it right now, the hair on the back of my neck sticks up exactly. because it, it it's just real. But Austin has, um, it's been cool to see his career grow at the Elite Series. And that to me is like the biggest, and I, and I know for you too, for any of us like that work with it, that's what you, that's, that's, I mean, we do our job to get paid, but that is the cool thing about our job. When you see somebody and you can help somebody along develop and, and become, you know, wh what they are. I mean, they, it's all of them doing it, but it's nice to I be able to be the person who gives them a little confidence to do that, you know, to be free to do that. And um, I think Austin Felix is, has been a star in the making for a long time, but I really just think like that's one of the cool things about fishing. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what, you know, whether you're outward and jokey, whether you're and recluse, it doesn't matter because when you're on the water, we're all even. And, and um, I'm not shocked to see him win. 
And I'm going to no. say it's not going to be his last. I mean, no. he, he has, knows what he's, he's doing. doing this for a long time. And exactly. Uh, I was really happy to see him win, but, I, but even more so happy. It just feels like all of a sudden the sleepy assassin makes sense. You know what I mean? Nobody's sleeping on him now. He's, uh, it just was a very cool, cool moment. Like, you know, with all of them, they have different things, but I just think somebody like Austin doesn't stand out when you put it on. He quietly goes about his business. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden he wins. It's like, y'all better be paying attention to this guy, this guy, because he's been doing this for a while. You yeah. know, this ain't no fluke. <laughs> no, not he, at all. He, 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 and you know, when he said that to his dad, I was actually flying the drone because Wes had to go pick uh, Hunter Lindsay up as the camera guy because he was in Matt Robertson's boat who had Which busted was- a, a jack plate bolt on his boat. So I ended up flying the drone, live drone at takeoff or at, a, at the weigh in. And when he said that, I could, I could hear it on calm because I was backstage flying the drone. So I missed the way in pretty much outside of what I could see on my monitor, but I heard what he said and I thought to myself, I, just, I got goosebumps, like thinking about this, like these, the last three years and, and probably the next couple of years to come are the wonder years for all these guys, these new guys on the elite series. They're not new anymore. They're all superstars at this point, but these are the wonder years, like 20 years from now, the guys that are going to be the mega you know, the mega stars of the sport, we're witnessing their childhood at the elite level now. And that's what to me makes this so special because you know, these guys, we're seeing so many, you know, firsts, first, yeah. first guy to, you know, this is his first win. And that's going to happen for a few more years. But then all of a sudden, after two or three more wins, you know, we're going to look back on these days and go, remember when we were at Lake Oahe? When Austin Felix won that tournament, he had a 23 pound bag. And one of the most important things that I think he said was that the interviews that you were doing before takeoff on championship Sunday. And he said, yes, I don't want to waste that 23 pound bag. This is an opportunity. I had a big bag, the biggest bag of the, of the show. And if I don't win this now, it, it was a wasted bag. And I thought that was vastly important at least at least impressionable from my perspective that that's how he looked at that 23 pound bag and honest again like everybody you want to know what to do on stage and be successful be honest be who you are it, you know if you if anybody that was there for those interviews we went from matt robertson who is <laughs> matt um <laughs> And he's, you know, it's like going from Ric Flair and Austin, like literally just, I put the mic in his face and he's like, I, I don't know how to follow that. At that then, volume he, too. At, at that at volume. Exactly that volume. But, but that's also Austin. Like if I, if there was no microphone and Matt was doing some stuff and I walked up to Austin and said, well, what do you have to say about that? He'd be like, he'd answer the exact same way. And for him to be that honest and say, this is what is burdening me. I know I'll special a 23 pound bag. And, and, and what I mean by that is I think that most people, we all fall into this. You know, I think everybody, when they start a job, they want to be like the people that they watched. You know what I mean? Um, right. And it's one of the worst things you can do. Like be you. I mean, if nothing, if YouTube has improved anything in the earth, it's like, People will accept you for you as long as it's genuinely really you. Like if Matt was acting a character, if that wasn't really him, people wouldn't accept it, but it is really him. And Austin is really him, but it's so much harder to accept yourself and be yourself when you're quieter like Austin, because you Mm -hmm. see so many quiet people that come up and they try to be different and try to be like Gerald or try to be, be yourself at whatever you are and people will gravitate to it. Cause I think that that's what's happening with Austin now. And I, you know, we've Taku, already talked about Takumi Lee, and Lee, exact Brandon Polinick swindle. I mean, you go uh, there, there's new guys that you can look at and say, that's what's happening to them. But then there's old guys and you say, that's why they are 
where they are now because they were genuine, authentic. They are who they are. They, they don't hold, they don't hold anything back when they, when they think they need to say something, but they also, you know, they, they, they're, they're just, they, they don't worry about being someone else. They, they just go fishing and, and they, they are who they are and they're comfortable with themselves in their own shell. I mean, Austin Felix, I mean, you know, when a lot of people didn't know his name, they knew he was the guy wearing the plaid pajamas, right? Yeah. And was that him being himself wearing pajamas on tour? Pajama pants. Yeah, flannels. well, it's, it, it, he used to start, I think it started, he wore them underneath his rain suit because he was just like, that's how he'd prefish. Warm. And he's kind of yeah, it's comfortable, sleepy and lazy. <laughs> just get up and I'm going to go. And then, you know, one thing led to another and he became known for it. And, um, Why does but again, go after a Hanes or a fruit of the loom and non endemic sponsorship. I know for a fact, there was one company who said that they could not sponsor him because he wears, wears pajamas. And I'm going to look in this camera right now. And I don't know who the company is, to be honest. I don't even remember. I, but I've heard through the grapevine, you're an idiot. To be honest, like to, to he's not unprofessional. You know what I mean? He's wearing. He's actually very professional. Yeah. So he actually doesn't wear pajamas most of the time. He actually has golf pants that are printed like pajamas because I think enough of our crudgety fishing world told him that's unprofessional or whatever. And then we met Matt Robertson this weekend and saw <laughs> pajamas ain't nothing. Speaking of pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um. But yeah, no, it's, I think that's the number one thing. Be yourself always, you know, you know, like, I mean, I, I think when fighter first came on the elite series, he wasn't quite himself. And now he is unapologetically himself. Um, speaking of which dude, did you see what he did at takeoff on Sunday? Not sure. Okay. So I'm standing right beside him. He and, was, and, we were boat number six out and he was number seven. So he was behind, but us. he hadn't pulled up to his oh, spot when he, yet. Oh, oh, the hand catch. Yeah. So he literally oh. looks down in the water, sees a small mouth and in typical, like anybody else did this. If they accomplished it, they would grab it and they would hold that small mouth up and be like, look what I just did or whatever. So, like if I did it, I mean, I would have shirts already printed about it. <laughs> I can the do hand it. snatcher. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, he just grabs it, bear paws, this smallmouth bass, two and a half, three pounder, holds it up. And is like, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, how? Like, that is the biggest flex in the history of fishing. I don't even need rods and reels. I just grabbed this one. And but it, but it's such a Seth fighter move. The way he did it, like nonchalantly. Yeah, me and his camera guy, <laughs> Seth, were talking yesterday and uh Seth's like, I wish he had told me he was going to do it. Like, he just, like, I wasn't even, and he's just like, next thing we know, like, I was standing right beside him and I hardly even seen it, you know? And, but that's just typical Seth being Seth. Like, um, I do have a video, an awesome video of Seth that I share every once in a while. Um, and it's, Paul and Nick and him are doing, I think it was like a Rapala interview thing that they were doing because they're both sponsored by Rapala. And, Someone fires a cigarette at Palnick. Or oh, I was there. Palnick, I was filming. Seth. I was filming Seth when he did that. That was at the St. Lawrence River. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right along yeah. behind our trailer. Yeah. Yeah. And Seth goes, Seth. So this fits, smoke gets fired at Seth and Seth goes and catches he, it. He, it was an end over end. Yeah. End like over a end. kickoff end over end cigarette. Exactly. Catches it in his mouth. <laughs> now, again, anybody on earth would be like, look what I just did. Print mm -hmm. T-shirts on the smoke catcher. Seth goes like this. Seth catches it and goes, hmm, wrong way around. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> he caught it on the on the nose tip, not the butt end. Of yeah, it. not the filter end. Yes, yeah. that was that was me and you and EK. Yeah, Kevin EK Van Dam, smoke Polinick, and Seth Fighter. <laughs> I remember that specifically. But again, another dude that is unapologetically himself. Like, I think we get so stuck. I hear people backstage saying this stuff to anglers. Like, you know, make sure you smile. Make sure you, yeah, be, but above all else, be real. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't, 
You shouldn't smile when you lose. I get it. Like you should, should be a a good loser, but it shouldn't. You shouldn't enjoy it. It sucks. It, I mean, you don't and, have to bite someone's ear off, but yeah, no, no, <laughs> don't be a psychopath. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but just be real. Be real. So yeah, I agree. We have a our anglers. You know, the elite series. It's like a bowl of alphabet soup. And everybody's, everybody's different. There's still some people that haven't come out of their shell, probably just because, you know, they haven't done as well as they wanted to over a three year period. And they're still trying to figure it out. And there, there's so much anxiety and pressure on them to stay in the series, or at least to, you know, make a run at, at trying to make a living at this. But, you know, the ones that have have perpetually done well, cash checks almost every tournament, those guys have settled into their to their character and and, and everyone's different yet. Um, and, and you see it, you know, you see it out there on on screen or on stage or whatever it is, like you're saying. They've learned to be themselves. Lee Livesey and I, this was a very big part of our conversation yesterday. Uh, we were talking on the phone. We were talking about how how genuine and authentic you have to be to be successful from a sponsorship perspective in this sport. Oh, yeah. That- and those and those 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 brands latch on to the people that fit their style. Like, I mean, the most the most vivid would be ugly stick. To Matt Robertson, I mean, yeah. what better match could there possibly be besides, you know, Bush Light and Lee Livesey, <laughs> or Whiskey Myers and Lee Livesey? <laughs> yeah. Now, do do you think you said how important it is to the sport? Do you think it is more the sport or this time? Because I think honestly, if you look around, like I didn't even follow golf, but I did see the dude who won the won the British Open, and he looks just like Seth fighter. He's got a mullet. He's like, I feel like if anything in the past TV chose who was famous. Like if you really look like, I'm not talking fishing. I'm talking like Haynes they- underwear. What does Haynes underwear have to do with Michael Jordan? But that was a huge, huge endorsement that he gave Haynes underwear for many years. He made millions of dollars off that, but that was, that had nothing to do with his authenticity or character. It had everything to do with his superstardom and how many eyes he could put on that brand, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and Johnny Carson was in control of who was funny. If he decided you weren't funny, which I think is one of the weirdest things in the history of <laughs> talk shows. I mean, I'm a huge Johnny Carson fan, obviously, but the fact that he had that kind of control, whether he invites you over to the seat after your set and the world would be like, oh, Johnny says so and so is funny, or that person's not funny. The internet changed that. the uh, The internet decided, you know, who's. So I think people are just able to be more genuine. You know, a guy we talk, I've talked about a bunch, and pretty obsessed about a dude sure. called Mr. Beast, who is it was the one of the biggest people on YouTube, and he has a hundred over a hundred million subscribers. But he got those by being himself, not by playing a character. You know what I mean? Even the goofy name, Mr. Beast, you know, he that was assigned to him through a video game. You know what I mean? That's why. But but it's his video shouldn't be successful. His videos shouldn't. But that's if you leave it up to a network to decide that he's successful because he's himself. And that's very true, man. And, and we're all getting, everyone's getting used to having a camera in their face too. So people can be more comfortable. And then when you see someone like that become successful because of their authenticity, then it becomes a trend. Authenticity becomes an actual trend. Like, dude, all I got to do is be myself. I just got to yeah. put this stuff out there. Right. And then all this, now you've got a society that lives in this, in this, in this fake yet authentic world <laughs> if i can say it that way you know well, i think that's why so many people went crazy in the past like you look at the amount of celebrities i would hope in the future it would be less but probably not but i mean like if you look at how many go crazy but it's like because they have to keep this character up you know what i mean like uh, it, being real allows you not to you know have to fake it i guess And be nervous because you can just be yourself. I got a question for you before we end here. I know we've been running for a little over an hour now, but 
who was the first person to really brand themselves in bass fishing? Oh. Who would you say? Was Gotta it pre KVD? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, like as far as like a full on brand, like, yeah, Denny Brower did an incredible job. A lot of stuff, but I, I think as far as like holding on to the uh, creating a brand yourself, you know what I mean? KVD. I, I, yeah, yeah, like well, I think that that actually came from the late great Tim Tucker, one of the greatest outdoor writers ever. I think he coined Kevin KVD. Mm-hmm. Um, I think um, somebody will correct it if we'll it's wrong. Ask, That's we'll how the internet Kevin works. That. I'm pretty sure it, it was Tim Tucker, but. Um, so, but he's embraced it and became a thing and the colors he wears and everything is tighted, tightened in. Um, he's definitely the Tom Brady of our industry. Um, no no and then doubt. there's been others, you know, obviously Skeet, um, obviously Ike. Um, G-Man. Uh, yeah, so many of them. G-Man. Uh, like, I, I hate BMP. when people say give one because I'm totally a, missing something really obvious, but it, off the top of my head, I'd say Kevin was the first and, and, um, to really kind of what I was thinking out. when I asked the question. Yeah. 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 It, um, and now like it's, it's overdone. Like if you ask me, like I hear from collegiate kids that I'm working on my brand and I'm like, you're in college. You should not, you should be working on a keg party. You know what I mean? Like your brand, right. like really right. your brand just be you and develop and your brand will develop. There's times to be worried about a brand. Like I think way too many people are like, yeah, all I'm like, I mean, read through any internet video. There's people that are like, man, all I need is a sponsor. And then it's look out. It's not that easy. There's so much like it's perpetual work that you got to put into it. But I would say Kevin was, was the first. I think one of the, one of the things that, creates authenticity and there was a, a phrase i don't know who coined it i'm sure he didn't but he was the first person i heard say it is one of my uh, photography con- colleagues in the outdoor world lee chose um he owns he's part owner in boss shot shells and he's okay. been one of the most prolific uh outdoor photographers ever I and mean, he would you know he's he's been doing this for years anyhow he said to me one time he said you know uh, to be authentic, you have to be that guy that's willing when everyone else is running one direction, you have to be the guy willing to turn around and run the other direction. That's mm-hmm. what creates that. If you can do that and you feel good about that and confident, that's your authenticity. Yeah. Because you go find your own way, right? I mean, Jason, that's how Jason Christie fishes. No one ever sees him in practice and you rarely see him in a tournament. When I'm in his boat, there's never anyone around. You know what I mean? He's off doing some doing like he says, he's off doing it his way. Yeah. And and he's been successful. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's, and you know, that's why I was making such a big deal about Austin because I think like when you're Matt, it's easy to be yourself in some ways when you're John Daly, (laughs) It's easy to be yourself because you're loud, stand out. It's a whole lot tougher. Like I could only imagine the amount of people that growing up would have said to Austin, you know, you, oh, you need to do this more, do that more. You know, the same thing with Seth. You know what I mean? Like people would t- say that about Seth or any of the quieter. Caleb Kufal. Yeah. Yeah. Any, but I love that they, they're at a point where they feel comfortable in their skin to be themselves. And I I think that no matter what you do for a living, do that. Because if you show up the first day and you're playing a role, you're going to be playing a role for the rest of your life. And uh, sooner or later you'll go nuts and um, it generally doesn't work out good. Yeah. What else happened at this event? Robin Williams. Oh, that's the saddest story on earth. Yeah. I love Robin Williams. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I got a Robin Williams story. Do you know this? It's a true story. I swear to you. Um, so I met Robin Williams once and it was at one of his shows and I got tickets and somebody said, Hey, do you want these backstage? You get to a meet and greet. And I generally don't like those kind of things just because literally you corral through, meet somebody and they're just like, I can't wait till this is done so I can. Um, exactly. They just want to get home. <laughs> so 
it was after the show, like right after the show, you got to go to this area and we go backstage with Massey Hall, which is such an awesome place in Toronto. It's like a, like it's one of, it's probably the most historic, you know, three level theaters in everything's happened there, but it's got that, you know, that colonial feel to it or whatever. It's got, you know, it's a really cool venue. I mean, it's one of the best places to see. It's not huge. It's like, I think between 3,500, and 5,000 people sit in it. So it's a smaller sure. venue, but it's, it's but classic. that's kind of what makes it cool, right? Like it's yeah. old. Um, you could see an opera there or you yeah. could see a rock concert in there, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah I saw Robin Williams and a bunch of other stuff actually. But go. so I go downstairs and I'm standing in this lineup to meet uh, Robin Williams. And weirdly enough, um, while I'm standing there, there's a lady that, is like in the line and another spot in the line. And you know, when someone's there and you know, they're talking about you, like you're not sure, but, and when you're on TV, you have to ignore it because you can't be like, Hey, are you talking about me? Cause then you they think turn you're just look, a jackass. You turn away, <laughs> turn away and look the opposite direction. <laughs> so this lady finally comes over to me and she's like, she's freaking out. She's like, are you, you're the fishing guy. My son loves you. She's like, you know, he's a huge <laughs> fan. Like, she's totally fangirling. So she's making a big deal out of me. And while this is happening, I look, and Robin Williams is now looking in my direction. And uh, he's kind of just signing things, but he keeps and she goes away and comes back with this piece of paper that she found because I got to sign something for her kid. And I do. And this doesn't happen all the time. I'm not being that guy. Okay. No, it no, just no. happened. I'm it was perfect timing. And um, so uh, she goes away and I assigned something for her son and I'm standing there. And then a few people later, me and Sarah walk up to meet Robin Williams and Robin Williams is like, well, maybe I should be asking for your autograph. And I said, <laughs> well, no, no, I have not won any Oscars or accomplished anything good. I just go fishing. And Robin's like, you fish? And I said, yeah. And he said, I'm just getting into fishing. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to happen. Me and Robin Williams are going to be friends wow. and, and look out. And uh, he says, well, so how do you make a living fishing? I said, well, I host a show and everything. And he said, well, what's your show on? And I told him the channel that, that we're on Sportsnet because he was in Toronto for another three days. And I said, it was, this was a Friday night. And I'm like, it's actually on at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and Sunday morning, if you miss it. And he said, he said, what channel? And, and while this is happening, his handler is like trying to move us along because that's right. kind of their job. And he's Last like, no, talk. no, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. We're talking about fishing. So, wow. so he's like, oh, and he's, he's like, I'm going to watch your show tomorrow. And he said, um, he said, so I, could you teach me fishing? And I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> you had me at can. <laughs> You're like, uh, totally. I, I mean, to Robin Williams wants me to teach him fishing. And the way he said it, can you teach me fishing proves to you that he needed to be taught fishing. Um, so <laughs> William says, and he said, because I'm just getting into it. And he said, it's, it's kind of, you know, you don't know what to throw and you got all these things and I want to learn and something I really want to do more of. Wow. And uh, so I'm all like, yeah, yeah, let's let's go fishing. And I gave him my contact. And we literally spent five minutes talking and people in the lineup were like, what's going on here? And the handlers like move along. And so he gave my card to the handler and everything. And me and Robin said goodbye to each other, destined to be best friends forever. Um, and. Uh, I never heard from him again. <laughs> so <laughs> one of two things happened. One of two things happened. A, um, if you remember, he had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. He had that heart attack just a few weeks after this. So, or he watched my show and thought, I'm not never calling this jackass <laughs> ever again. But I did have five minutes for me and Robin Williams. We're what best a great buddies. Story. And I have a picture to prove it if anybody doubts. What a um, great story. Oh, yeah. Wild. wild. That's dude, totally cool. Story of my life, dude. I'm this close <laughs> to greatness always. See, you're an onion too, man. You got lots and lots of layers to oh, your I once almost, be, I've, I don't know if I've told you this story. I Should we end this or should I tell this story? It's up to you. It's your show. <laughs> tell the okay. story. Come on. Okay, tell Can't the story. Leave it We're here. We're here. 
So I almost became best friends with Joe Rogan, too. And it was like right on Rogan's rise. And so you would have been like a legit friend. And he is basically, in my opinion, the after male fear Oprah. factor. Oh, yeah. After fear factor uh, pre podcast really blowing up, like mm -hmm. doing the podcast at the time. But it was not anything what it is here today. Sure. Um, because he's literally the male Oprah. Like if he endorses, no like one of the major reasons meat eater is what it is in this industry is because they were on Rogan's podcast and the, you know, that relationship. So, so I want to be his friend because I think he's cool, but I also want to be his friend because I mean, how awesome is it to be Joe Rogan's friend and we're in the outdoors and like, it'd be just awesome. And maybe he'll put me on a silly podcast. Not, not that it's silly, but I mean, it's a badass podcast. So I, let me get to the story. We're in Vegas and we're up in the ghost bar and I have this buddy who is a host in Vegas. So he takes like high net worth gamblers and he makes sure they have a good time. That's Somehow true. me and him became buddies. Somehow he got a kick out of me. It, I am not a high net worth. Don't even gamble. Um, so, but somehow we became friends and we've kept in touch. So we're at the ghost bar and that's the bar on top of the palms where the roof opens up and everything. It's awesome. I've actually used the remote to open the freaking roof. It's <laughs> wild. I mean, you want to feel like power. Just, oh, nobody knows but you. So anyways, we're there. And it was when uh, one of the UFCs was in town. And we actually went to the fight. But after the fight, we go up to the top of the ghost bar. We're having a good time. And well, who walks in? Joe Rogan. Um, Goldie, the guy who used to commentate with the time. And a bunch of different people. And uh, they go sit in some VIP booth. And so I'm drinking with my buddy and my wife. Hang on there. one second. Is he taller than me or am I taller than him? I think I'm taller than Joe Rogan. Close. It is close. I mean, you guys, <laughs> you guys could do definitely pose for a fight together. I mean. <laughs> nose to nose. I don't know. How, how tall are you? I'm 5'8". I think he's right there. 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, I'd say he's right there. He's five seven. Um, if he had become my friend, I would have told you <laughs> you were shorter. Um, <laughs> so to give, and my wife hates when I tell this story, but again, that's what makes it a good story. Um, so this guy, my buddy, has been giving us drinks all night, and we're like literally standing at the bar with his friend that's a bartender, and it's like our own private bar, and it's just like one after another, and it's just it's a Vegas thing. And like 99% of the time, I get inebriated and embarrass my wife but there's like that one percent of time that that she does it and she just she just i mean it's like been twice our whole relationship um but once was with joe rogan so my buddy's like hey let him chill you know we're not gonna jump on joe we're gonna let him chill have a few sure. drinks and then i'll casually bring you over introduce you he loves the outdoors he'll love you you know i this guy, he knows Joe, like he's dealt with them. This is he's great. actually a huge outdoor fan. I know two people that have been on a show that are hunters. Oh, yeah. Blew up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Everybody. I mean, he loves the outdoors. Um, so he's like, this is, this is great. We're going to, I'm going to meet Joe Rogan. And no matter what happens, I mean, I'm going to meet Joe Rogan and hang out with him for a little while. And, and we're just drinking away and having a good time. And, and I told, Sarah, I'm like, we're, we're going to meet Joe Rogan. And she's like, oh, wow, that's cool. I know you've always wanted to meet him and whatever. And we continue drinking. And uh, it gets right about the time that, like, we've been there for a little while. And she says, I'm going to go to the restroom. She goes to the restroom, right? And, she, I mean, we're having a good time, let's just say. <laughs> like, it's Sure. So the next thing I see, she's in Joe Rogan's booth. And she's talking to Joe Rogan. Like, she is, like, face-to-face. Telling him all sorts of stuff like about how she likes his commentary and everything like that. And <laughs> and fine. And nobody knew who she was. Like, she just like walked right in there. And and finally, I think somebody said, well, you got to move along. And I'm like, oh, my God, you, you, you didn't talk to Joe Rogan already, did you? Because now I can't meet him because now I'm the guy with the drunk wife that was this far from his face telling him about the UFC. Lord knows what she said. <laughs> So you had another brush with greatness. I did not meet Joe Rogan uh, that night. And uh, um, yeah, that's I still a cool old, story. It is. I mean, it could have cool, been so much cool, better. Hey, that's a cool life story. <laughs> it, it is. It is a cool life story. And um, it, 
and I can't even give her crap about it. Like to this day, I mean, this is the most payback I get on my wife is by telling it in a public forum because so many times in life I have been the idiot. <laughs> and this was like just one of the very few times that she was, but, um, yeah, well, that you was and my- I have to meet sometime. We have, we have to go do something non fishing related uh, that's fun sometime. We have to meet to go to a Whiskey Myers concert or something. We've been talking about that for a while. We got to go do this sometime. Yeah. Yeah. No, we have to. We have we'll make to make our own stories. Oh, <laughs> leave that wife at home. No, she's, I love her. She's incredible. She's great. She's just great. not great at meeting Joe Rogan. Just <laughs> or letting you meet Joe Rogan. Just a few minutes. If you had to wait, just a few minutes. Um, but it's okay. It's okay. It's all good. Um, we are where we're meant to be. And uh, I'm happy to be where I am, dude. We have a pretty freaking cool gig. And the good news is by the time that this airs, we'll be on our way back to the next one, which is the final event of the year in Lacrosse, Wisconsin, where you last, our last champion in Lacrosse was one Ish, Ish Monroe, Ish Monroe. Which you covered. So um, I love me some Ish. I miss him. He's one of dude, the dudes that- I really miss. That that was incredible. I actually had, was having a tough time sort of breaking through the ish shell, you know. But then on day four, I had him day day two, day three, and day four. I had him three days there. And I had Chris Zaldane on day one, which he was fishing by this railroad bridge. And that's where I that's where I actually met Chris Zaldane. But but uh moving on to ish, he caught he found this 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 pocket of lily pads that was just freaking loaded. And that's the first time I'd ever seen a largemouth bass eat a baby blackbird because the wind was blowing. And there was like a, I don't know what you call it, a rookery or, you know, these blackbird yeah. nests all up in these trees. And they were blowing baby blackbirds out of the, the wind was blowing so hard. It was blowing birds, baby <laughs> birds out of their nest. And as soon as they hit the water, it was, just, poosh, these bass were in there feeding on, on, on the the baby birds that's not what they were primarily feeding on no but it just happened to be going on while we were there and that event opened my eyes to a lot of different things and of course ish was throwing i have some really great pictures of how thick those mats were and all the frog trails all the trails that he was leaving behind where he was throwing and uh it was an incredible event he probably caught 70 to 100 fish a day and after the tournament, after, you know, he, he knew he won, um, it was pretty cool. Somewhat bonding after the event with Ish at that moment, because he was so happy and elated that he had won the tournament. And we had spent three days together. It was pretty cool, man. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a really, really cool dude. I, I need to have him on here. We, we, he, he was on at the beginning when we first started the podcast, but I need to have him on for like a longer interview and talk to him. Cause dude, if this will open up some of the stuff he must've seen and heard and dealt with. And I mean, he is an amazing, and I'll say one thing about this Monroe, you ain't going to outwork him. I mean, and I don't mean no. just on the water. I mean, off the water, as far as promoting his sponsors and, uh, he's, he's a very, compet- very competitive individual. And, um, uh, you know, don't, this is a, uh, probably a whole nother podcast topic too, but you know, he was a trailblazer oh. and, and did a lot, did a lot of, of great things for bass fishing and, created a lot of acceptance around who, you know, who he is and all that stuff. And, and so, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure I, this will be a completely different tournament, but I was very, I feel very fortunate to have been in Ish's boat for that long for three days uh, on the, the last time we were there. I mean, he, he flat, he, he and Jacob Peroznik were battling it out at the top position and they were, th- they're both throwing frogs. Jacob was in, the woods he was in the flooded timber and standing timber and ish was out on the lily pads and so they were doing two in two different environments doing the same thing but i, I just remember them battling it out for the top spot yeah i think this week's tournament's going to be cool like i, I think Prosnick's going to be in the mix i think christy's going to be in the mix i think hackney's going to be in the mix lee like a lot like it's going to be an old school 
Bassmaster exactly. Throwdown. And Ex- um, exactly, I'm excited about it. I'm excited. These guys and, are going to be ripping, ripping line drives and home runs over the fence. I think this is going to be really, really cool. A great way to end the season. Yeah, yeah. And did you know that the weigh-ins had a baseball diamond after you used that analogy? No, really. Yeah, the the lacrosse loggers, my favorite minor league baseball team in that part of the world, the lacrosse loggers. We're doing way in at, at the baseball, like takeoff. Everything is right there. So different wow. location this time. So come on down. Let's fill that friggin' st- And that's the other cool thing about lacrosse. It is full of like hardcore bass heads. Like no, I'm sure doubt. Jeremiah and the boys have got an elite fest, whatever, ready to go. They are always looking to party and have a good time. And here's what I will say is that elite fest party thing they do it it might be more dangerous with this group of anglers <laughs> than ever before because these boys they a lot of our crew still a lot of our field still likes they're young. To party they're young um, there's, yeah, they, there's a lot of young guys yeah do you know that like what you just said that part of the world is full of hardcore bass anglers the the brand new 2022 bassmaster national high school champions are from Wisconsin. I was just there at Hartwell uh, a few days before Lake Oahe covering that event. And the two kids that won that are from that area in Wisconsin. They're actually going to be at the weigh-ins for this event. Which oh, cool. Will be pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, I hope I get to meet them. Yeah. Uh, on a less wholesome note, lacrosse has the most bars per capita of any city in America. Let's go check some out. How about that, Dave? <laughs> we will do that. <laughs> Jake, it's always so much fun talking to you. I'll see Likewise. you uh, in a couple of days. And I guess this is it. We're done. Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear? <laughs>